Hey guys. Yurizi here. This is part 3 of what if Sakura became independent. Hit like and subscribe and also don't forget to check the author. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. <laughs> Chapter 15, Ligerophobia, Part 1 Sakura retrieved Naruto after a brief inspection of the somewhat ragged bite marks in Sasuke-kun's neck convinced her that they were less worrying than the dark blotches pooled like ink beneath his skin, forming some kind of seal. Or at least that was her best guess. Fuinjutsu was leagues beyond academy material, so she had to accept that whatever purpose it was meant to serve— she could only take away from it that he'd wanted Sasuke-kun alive and all she could do was wait it out. If she handled Naruto more roughly than was strictly called for because she was more than half convinced this was his fault, even if Sakura knew logically that their escape was unlikely from the moment that man decided that Sasuke-kun was his prey, she was still angry enough at him that she didn't feel a shred of guilt. She dropped him unceremoniously to the branch where she'd left Sasuke-kun, grimly considering what needed done and what she was capable of doing. She needed to get them out of this forest. Sakura didn't care if they forfeited this exam. She didn't care how upset her teammates might be. They could still be angry with her in another six months, when they'd be eligible to take the exam again. But that was only what she wanted. Unless a proctor intervened, or something else occurred, the chances of reaching safety without encountering the Otonin team were dismal. It was a large forest, yes, but someone like that wouldn't promise a visit from his team without being certain that it would occur. Not when she was absolutely certain that the man they'd met was Orochimaru, because how many people in the world could possibly be able to summon giant snakes so easily? There was a part of her that wanted to know why he needed Sasuke-kun at all, and another that wondered why he'd left Naruto and her alive and not just taken him when he'd collapsed. But the reasons didn't matter at this moment just surviving until there was a safer time to worry about those things. So what she needed to do was retreat to somewhere more defensible than this, somewhere where she could wait for Naruto to regain consciousness. Their chances still wouldn't be good, but they'd be better. She hadn't noticed any blood on him that hadn't come from where she touched him and his temperature and color were much better than Sasuke-kun's, so after attempting to a standard genjutsu dispel in case it was a subtle one she couldn't sense failed, she left him be. Sakura was mightily proud of herself for not kicking him in the side to test that theory. That reminded her that she still needed to bind up the wound in her own side, which didn't take her very long. She just swabbed it down with an antiseptic towelette and pressed a bandage firmly over it. Because she hadn't torn away, it was a fairly clean puncture and the pain, compared to Wave, was hardly worth mentioning. If her arms ached from holding herself up inside the snake, that too could be ignored. First aid finished, she tucked her trash back in her pouch and considered the next pressing issue, which was one of logistics. There were two of the boys and only one of her. And she was fairly certain they both happened to outweigh her. She'd carried Tizuna before, who probably weighed as much as both of them combined, but that had been for a short distance, just like when she'd snatched Sasuke-kun. And even if she managed the weight itself, there were still two of them. Sakura needed her temples probably smearing more blood across her face as she did so though she'd scrubbed her hands with her towelette, as she considered the issue. It wasn't possible in the normal course of things for one girl to be capable of carrying that kind of burden. But she realized as she stared at their battlefield, it's not as if the normal rules apply. I can leap over twenty feet from a standstill. It's not as if I don't know how to augment and reinforce my muscles and joints with chakra. There shouldn't be anything to stop me from doing that continually. That's the whole theory behind the Shunshin no Jutsu. Kakashi Sensei said I wasn't ready for that, but while that kind of speed would be useful, I just need a little more strength. That much she thought she might be able to do. As for her other issue, she found her solution in taking a great deal of pleasure cutting the arms off Naruto's jacket, as he was the only one with fabric to spare. She had wire in her kit, but she didn't keep any kind of rope. She tied the resultant strips into three different lengths. She crossed Naruto's arms across his chest and used the shortest of her lengths to tie his forearms together, forming a loop which she dragged over her head. That left Naruto draped down her back and she pulled his knees forward, 
tying him into a piggyback position that she further secured by the last length, which she looped under his arms, drawing the length between them and over her own shoulders, pulled it down under her own arms and tying it behind her back. By the time she was done, her shoulder joints felt mildly abused, but Naruto was as secure as she could make him. She'd been careful to try this close enough to Sasuke-kun that she wouldn't have to kneel and then rise again with Naruto's weight on her back and she gathered Sasuke-kun up far more carefully than she had her blonde teammate. As he lay quiescent in her arms, she experienced a brief flash of jealousy. She wanted Sasuke-kun to be carrying her heimstyle and taking responsibility for getting all of them out of this forest alive. There was only one good thing about this, she thought as she stood up carefully. Sasuke-kun's weight balanced out Naruto's, so she didn't have to worry about leaning forward or back to counterbalance. And they weren't as heavy as she'd feared, but she could feel it as a steady drain on her chakra. If they'd ever taught a lecture at the academy about going to ground with your teammates unconscious, Sakura had somehow missed it, though at just this moment it seemed like an awfully practical lecture to have. But she had sat through lectures on defensible positions, and though their practicals hadn't been conducted in forests quite like these, she had some idea what she was looking for. Almost forty minutes of making toward the tower later, where there were guaranteed to be adults whereas the borders of the zone were probably less well patrolled, she found what she was looking for. Large branches that had broken out of treetops and caught on their way down, somehow tenuously held in place without any guarantee of staying there, were called widowmakers for good reason. Sometimes it was whole treetops, ripped free in especially violent storms. At other times, it could refer to whole trees, twisted or broken midway up the trunk and not yet come down. With these behemoth trees, even branches were the size of the normal tree trunks and when Sakura caught sight of an immense branch suspended by what seemed a very tenuous, fraying little section and the unsteady support of some nearby branches, she had a flash of inspiration. It was a death trap waiting to happen. And it was just what Sakura needed. She kept a wary eye on the branch as she came beneath it, flinching every time the wind made it creak, but she didn't have time to waste on fear. One of the trees almost directly below it had heavy curtains of moss growing up its roots, and she carefully pulled them up and away without tearing them. A kunai was not a shovel, but it was the best thing she had to work with, and she set to it with an industriousness born of fear. Luck seemed to be slightly on her side in this instance for she hadn't done much digging when she collapsed a wall of earth and discovered some sort of animal den. Its entrance was from the other side of the route, which was why she hadn't noticed it to begin with, but it lessened her need to dig considerably. It seemed abandoned, with no fresh tracks leading in, which was why she felt fairly confident in stowing her teammates inside once she'd widened the entrance on her side enough. She sealed it back when she managed to shove both of them inside restoring the moss to as much of an undisturbed position as possible, counting on the animal's entrance to provide fresh air. Sake hoped that neither of them woke up and panicked, thinking that they'd been buried alive, but she didn't have much time to spare for their feelings. She made her way into the trees next, using Sasuke-kun's wire and blasting powder to rig a deadfall on a scale she'd never imagined it could be done. And when she was finished, she layered the megan, Kokoni Areza no Jutsu over it, so that to anyone not paying much attention or to anyone insensitive to Jinjutsu, it looked like a normal branch. Most of her quick and dirty trap knowledge relied on using young saplings to fling kanai or shuriken or pull tight snares, but these trees were so enormous and well established that there wasn't enough light or water for much underbrush. This sort of environment, or really any sort of environment, was why Dotan users were considered the trap masters of the ninja world. She didn't have enough time to dig pitfalls by hand, so she crossed that off her mental list, alongside anything that required complex seals or blasting powder or much in the way of equipment. So, Minefield was out. She wasn't certain she would have been able to stomach the results, regardless. Shrapnel damage was an ugly thing, even in photographs, and having seen the result of fire, she didn't know if she was frightened enough to do such a thing with premeditation. In the moment, to save herself, she might do anything, but there was a vast gulf between that and setting out to do something as likely to maim as kill outright. What would she do if they survived the initial blast? Would she have enough composure to finish what she'd started? And if the answer to that was yes, how much would she have to pay for it in her nightmares later? 
She didn't take too much time to consider what ifs, though. Just enough time for a deep, stabbing feeling of regret on how limited her equipment was. She'd already lost four kunai inside the first snake and she couldn't raid her teammates' supplies entirely, so even a clever system of trip wires hidden in the grass that would pull tight wire at throat level was costly in terms of supplies. She limited herself to only those points of ingress that would be difficult for her to keep under surveillance. In the other places, she rigged devices more aimed toward alerting her to anyone's approach than causing harm, all of which were done with scavenged materials. And when that was finished, all she had left to do was wait. And worry. As that waiting dragged on and on and she found herself twitched at insect noises, she had a brief thought that she suddenly understood why Kakashi-sensei dragged that nasty book everywhere. It wasn't the preparation that was the worst thing. It was the waiting, where her imagination was free to invent all sorts of terrible things, that was proving to be the hardest obstacle to overcome. Because, now, she had time to consider just what she was staying to face. Time to lose her nerve, to consider abandoning her teammates. If it was just her, she knew that she'd probably make to the tower. She'd live on, without having to endure the pain she was certain was coming. But she thought as she dropped her head into her hands, if she ran now, that would be it. She'd be the trash Kakashi-sensei had talked about. At the same time, she really, really did not want to be here. Those two conflicting emotions were pressing so hard on her that she was almost glad when something tripped one of her alerts, and she raised her head to see three shinobi stride into the clearing. She recognized them from registration, but the notes on their hatait would have given them away regardless. Sakura didn't say anything, just stood and waited to see how they would proceed. She remembered how Kabuto had fared against them, so she wasn't about to risk herself in a head-on attack. They seemed somehow surprised to see her. Of course, she had a good idea that she looked like an escapee from a splatter film, blood drying in her hair and turning it into a stiff spiked mess, making her clothes stink like a slaughterhouse, and itching as it flaked from her skin. It was the bandaged ninja with the strange gait who moved into the clearing first, and demanded gruffly, Girl, where's Sasuke? Sakura shrugged, relieving some of the tension and stiffness in her shoulders from where she'd been sitting and anticipating this fight. His single eye narrowed. I'm not in the mood to play games with you, girl. Get Sasuke. He's the only reason we're in this village. Or is he too much a coward to come out and fight? Got himself a girl protecting him? That earned him a dirty look from his female teammate, but Sakura acknowledged that had either Naruto or Sasuke kun been conscious, that sort of taunt would have brought Naruto out of hiding and at least primed Sasuke kun to reveal himself. Sorry to disappoint, Sakura said curtly, but apparently Orochimaru's presents cut two ways. She was interested to see Dosa's eye narrow at the mention of Orochimaru's name. What do you mean by that? The one in the middle demanded. Dosu? Yes, something like that. And the one to his left was Zaku, and their Kunoichi was kin. Does it matter? Maybe the sound of us killing his girlfriend here will be enough to flush him out of hiding, Zaku sneered. Given how he looked when she'd walled them up, Zaku could have tortured her for days without achieving that. Maybe she'd be more willing to talk if we roughed her up a little? Kin suggested, and that made a smirk break across Zaku's face so she wasn't surprised when the three of them leapt toward her. Her substitution was as quick as certain knowledge that no one was coming to help her could make it, and before they could even look up, she'd already slammed her hands together in the final seal for the Megan, Narakumi no Jutsu. Chapter 16, Ligerophobia Part 2 Sakura struck as soon as she saw the ghost, the hilt of her kunai impacting with a sickening crack just behind Dosa's temple. He crumbled instantly and she began to pivot toward Zaka next, but Kin's hand was already slapping down on his shoulder, and she was regretting the seconds she'd thought to save pulling the stabbing end of her kanai free. The blast of air hit her like a wall, and she wasn't entirely certain the creak from her ribs was a product of her imagination, but she skidded back some twenty feet from the force of the blow, digging the fingers of her open hand into the turf, and using chakra to keep herself from being sent tumbling. To break free that easily, She's either a genjutsu specialist, or they're ridiculously overqualified to become chunin. Probably both, Sakura thought to herself as she just avoided another blast, the wind ruffling her hair. And one's got a weapon I can feel but can't see. 
Her body was trembling from the fear and the frustration, but she forced her breathing to slow from its quick, erratic pace. She wasn't going fresh into this battle. Sakura didn't need to compound that. Not when she was facing two enemies who were the subordinates of Orochimaru. If she was facing Zaku alone, she'd feel more confident in being able to test the limits of his ability without getting critically injured, but there was also kin to consider. And as she dodged another blast, this one carrying Kanai in it, and found herself sprouting a shoulder full of Saban needles for her trouble, she spared enough time for a single, vile thought that encompassed Orochimaru, the proctors, and Naruto. Then she didn't have any more time to spare. They were both rushing her, and while that gave them both space to mock her freely, it took every lesson that Kakashi Sensei and the Niken had painfully inscribed into her mind and muscles to just keep herself from further injury. The Simban burned and pulled every time she moved her arm, but she'd only managed to pluck out the most painful, though action was working the others loose. God, this is annoying, Kin snarled as Sakura twisted herself out of the way of another barrage of Simban, one passing so close to her right eye she'd swear she'd felt it brush against her eyelashes, and she had to shove through a wall of almost in my eye. To not freeze up. What good are you when you won't even scream? We're here for Sasuke not to waste time playing with the likes of you. Need something to change the field. If it stays like this, I'm going to make a mistake. And that will be it, she thought with gritted teeth. I just need to. The sound of bells jerked her full attention back to the external battlefield as she flipped backwards, while behind the line where a group of Samban, bells still tingling merrily, divided the battlefield. What, just going to keep running away? Zaka taunted. Man, I knew Kanohanin were pathetic, but that's just sad. You can take care of her, Kin. I'll see if I can't find our prey. No way does a Kanohanin just leave her teammates. He's gotta be around here somewhere. He glanced over to where his teammates still lay unconscious. If Dosa doesn't wake up soon, he's gone to miss out on all the glory. Kin shrugged, and it's his problem, not mine sort of fashion, fresh Simban already splayed like spines in her hand. Sakura had two kunai in hand and she darted forward, ducking beneath the jangling group of Samban in her attempt to get at Kin. She saw the shadow wave. She had only a split second to decide and as she felt the Samban go deep, burning as they pierced skin and her movement tore muscle, she had a moment's regret, but she gritted her teeth and shoved herself forward. As she pressed onward regardless, she heard the previously still bells jingle, and she braced herself for another attack. It was only when her stumble wasn't a single misstep that she could write, but like the first signs of a stroke, a terrible inability to move her body like she ought to be able to, that she had the first premonition of Kin's real ability. She couldn't get her eyes to focus, seeing double, triple, more, and it was difficult to even stay upright. Sakura almost fell, caught herself awkwardly with one hand, and her stomach lurched. Bile spattered across the ground and the back of her hand. Kin's laughter seemed to chase her as she made a retreat that followed a drunkard's path, weaving and tripping, but urged on by desperation to a quickness that meant she saw the world as a series of multiple afterimages, worse than any fever dream. But she kept at it, pushing herself up again and again as she almost fell. Until she stumbled in such a way that she couldn't recover from, over a protruding root that her genjutsu-addled senses missed. She cried out heavily as she landed and again as Kin's blunt nails left trails down her scalp, closing over her ponytail. Under all that blood, your hair's softer than mine, Kin said in a tone full of disgust. You must be so proud of it, she sneered, yanking hard. Sakura curled forward like she trying to pull away and Kin turned into a movement of her violence, pressing her head down until she was driving her forehead into the grass. Her hands hidden by her body. Sakura formed the familiar hand sign for concentration. Genjutsu Kai, Sakura thought to herself as she forcibly interrupted her chakra. The nausea and disorientation disappeared instantly, and what was left was Kin, doing nothing more than the bullies at the academy had done. Must not have had anyone to pull her hair, she thought nastily. Hurts less when you're pulling all of it. She levered herself up, even as Kin tried to press her head back down and saw that despite or rather because of Kin's efforts, her broken wing gambit had worked. Sakura's hand closed firmly around the wrist of the hand clutching at her hair, and she lunged forward, her free hand dropping her kanai to stiff-arm the wire hidden in the grass. 
The wire above her head, almost indistinguishable from spider silk as it swayed in the breeze, suddenly whined with tension as it was pulled tight enough to play pizzicato on. And from where Kin was standing, tight enough to slit her throat, if she'd been incrementally slower at bringing up a kunai up to keep the wire from slicing into her skin. The black-haired kunoichi was cursing aloud as she tried to hold it steady. The kunai itself pressed uncomfortable tight against her neck, and Sakura was silently cursing well-honed reflexes. But that didn't stop her from spinning her body up into a kick and catching the hilt of the kunai with the base of her heel. Driving it straight up into soft flesh. Kin had managed to shift back, just as little, as Sakura's kick had meant she'd shifted her grip on Kin's arm. Her hand on the hilt changed the angle unfavorably, and Kin had tilted her head back by reflex, so though Sakura felt the resistance of bone. The kunai scraped along the outside of her jawbone rather than going up into that defenseless triangle between jaw and neck. Bleeding freely, Kin dropped the kunai, hand coming up to check the severity of the wound, while the other dipped into her pouch. As soon as her foot touched back down, Sakura hooked one foot behind Kin's knees and jerked hard enough that the other girl fell heavily. Sakura drew one of her knives as she pounced, angling for the liver, managing to drive it perhaps half an inch before Kin landed a ringing blow upside her ear that snapped her head to the side and toppled her off the other girl. She managed to recover her feet before Kin could reverse the situation, struggling hard not to clutch at her ear like Kin was the neck wound. It was difficult not just because of the pain, which was bad enough, but also because a faint, tinny noise was all she could hear out of it. She tried hard not be set off balance by that, either physically or emotionally, but it would be so, so easy to just run away now. It hurts, it hurts, was throbbing in her ear, the burning of Saban, the soreness of overworked muscles. Her grip tightened as Kin brought another handful of Saban up to her face and sneered at her through them. I'm going to make you pay for this, she promised. Sakura tensed, but before either of them could make any move toward the other, a voice from just behind Kin interrupted. Just so you know, I'm taking this. A cheerful voice interrupted and Kin half turned on one heel, to reveal a ninja who couldn't have been more than two foot from her. This was a scroll, being waggled idly in one hand. The ninja would have been cute in almost any other setting with the soft angled features that would always make him look years younger than his real age. His hair was in purposeful disorder, his fringe kept out of his face on the right by two yellow star barrettes that would have appealed to Sakura when she was about eight, the hair itself a light brown with a strangely purple tint to it, his eyes a shade of yellow. His clothing built on that image of childishness that he'd reinforced with his manner of speech, his shirt sleeves long enough to obscure his hands almost entirely. I took it off that fellow over there, he continued blithely, using the scroll to point to Dosu, as he didn't look like he needed it. Just so you're not wondering where it went later. Yu Kin said, darting forward, but he plucked a long knife from a horizontal sheath behind his back as he tucked the scroll away. He dodged her strike, opening up a slice on her arm when she overextended herself slightly. It wasn't a very long cut, but Kin's eyes widened and then she screamed. The easy smile never failed as Kin backed away from him, her breath coming as high-pitched pants, like little smothered screams. Her steps were unsteady and she'd gone pale, the first beads of sweat forming on her brow. Sakura got her first good look at his knife then and found it strange and cruel-looking, with full, deep serration along the length of the blade. There seemed to be some sort of decorative pattern etched into the blade, but she couldn't make it out and she wasn't about to risk getting closer. Kin, what the hell? Zaku demanded as he dropped down from where he'd been surveying the nearby area, but he cut himself off when he saw someone else had joined the field. Got, our, scroll, Kin managed to pant, your, turn, and then she retreated, almost collapsing against a tree at the far edge of the clearing as she emptied her stomach. Zaku's eyes narrowed as he glared at the interloper. What village are you from? Shouldn't you be with your team, not butting in on other people's battles? The stranger shrugged. Does my village matter? No one's friends in this forest. And as for my team, well, and there was a strange look in his eye for all that his tone never lost its lightness, the Sandman came and took them all away, so I really, really wanted to hurt somebody. And when I came upon you bunch trying to take down prey too big for you, I couldn't resist. That's okay, right, Wani-san? He asked, directing the question to Sakura. 
That he asked in the same tone a child might ask for a cookie was unnerving, but she dipped her head in assent. Better one questionable ally than yet another enemy. Zaka took it as a challenge, because this time the blast from those holes in his hands was much, much more powerful, digging a furrow as it went. But while Sakura leapt aside, the stranger didn't move, but before the airblade could touch him, he sheathed his knife, his hands flowing through signs, and he made a sharp gesture with his mouth, like a dog barking. She couldn't see it with her eyes, but the evidence, dust and grass blown away by a collision of wind fronts, suggested wind nature ninjutsu. Saka scowled, but it was movement from Dosa's previously still body that worried her. The stranger followed the direction of her gaze. No preferences, Nasan. One pain's as good as another, he said with an offhand salute, strolling lackadaisically toward the bandaged Otonin. She tried to shove that strange, brittle hardness in his eyes out of her mind, because Saka was coming. She wondered bitterly if those tunnels required far less chakra than regular nature manipulations, and just how deep his equipment pouches ran, because he wasn't offering her opportunities to close and showed no signs of the exhaustion she was feeling. And without closing, she had no way to end this battle in her favor, just desperately maintain the stalemate. He'd come down out of the trees, at least, and a thought came to Sakura. She had explosive notes in her pouch and a reluctance to use them, but the thought was heavy in her mind that if she'd struck harder, faster, more decisively, then she'd have one more death on her conscience, but one less fear driving her. And she discovered that this was one line she was willing to blur, if it meant survival. Whether that was admirable or not, she didn't know, but she did know that the only thought in her head wasn't one of regret, but a focus on watch my left, not my right. She never looked up, not once, relying entirely on her memory, as she made a calculated retreat. She tried to keep track of everyone and everything in the clearing, but found it beyond her skill, so did what she could to make her next attacks count, because timing was going to be everything. Kunai, Tag slapped hastily on their handle, blasted dirt into the air, concealing the flight of one kunai that did not fly with its fellows. A second, heavier wave forced him back and covered the noise of lesser explosions overhead and she rushed in, to give him no space to pay attention to anything but her. Something, though, must have alerted him to the danger, for at the last possible second, almost too late, he looked up. It was enough to save his life, but the massive trunk still clipped his shoulder, several tons of wood crashing down and tearing it free from the joint, breaking the collarbone and driving him to his knees. When the trunk hit the ground, it did so with a low, powerful sound and a rumble that shook the earth. Oh, not bad, a voice commented at her shoulder, and she glanced over to find their interloper looking on with an air of distinct satisfaction. Both of them jerked when a sudden, ominous aura suddenly pervaded the clearing, a forerunner to an eruption of purple-tinted chakra. Sakura stilled, her heart beating loud in her ears, as she took note of just where that chakra was coming from. Sasuke-kun, she said, voice breaking on the second syllable of his name. Who? My teammate. Brows pitched upward in question, he followed her gaze. Your teammate, he repeated with an intonation whose blandness spoke for itself. In that case, I'm going to feel free to leave, Naysan. It was fun to play, but it seems like your teammate's in a snit. Here, Naysan, he said, pressing something into the palm of her hand. A present, for being a good sport about the scroll. She didn't even glance down to see what it was. The scroll didn't matter to me, she said bitterly. You could have had ours if you'd liked. Thanks for helping. A soft huff of laughter. I don't think you really needed it, but the opportunity was too good to miss. If I couldn't touch the Sunanin, the arrogant Otonin were good enough. And I just needed the one scroll, he said. It's the principle of the thing. If my teammates died for the mission, I could at least finish it, promotion or not. With that enigmatic statement, he was gone and Sasuke-kun crested the trunk of the tree like a demon from some deep hell, his eyes gone red with Sharingan and markings like black flames crawling across his skin. He moved strangely, not quite a stagger but as if he wasn't in full control of his body either. He surveyed the battleground, Zaku still on his knees, clutching at a shoulder then sat far lower than it should have, Dosa panting from his brief bout against the stranger, shaking his head every so often like he couldn't get himself to focus, 
and Kin still making those terribly pained noises. Tears streaming freely down her cheeks as her arms swelled, the edges of the wound turning blue. But Sakura was also breathing heavily, Samban still caught in her flesh, the shallow gashes of kunai she hadn't quite dodged trickling blood, and her whole body felt like a bruise from Zaka's attacks. This was apparently enough to offend Sasuke-kun, because his eyes swept over the Otonin like a hawk looking over rabbits staked out as bait. They hurt you, he observed in a low, steady voice, his feet carrying him surely down the trunk to where Zaku was and the other boy struggled to his feet. Sakura didn't even see sasuke move, but suddenly he was behind Zaku and he had him on his knees, his good arm twisted back in a suppression hold. I should make this part of a matching pair for that, he said, twisting the arm back and up until it cracked and Zaku screamed. The self-satisfied smirk that twisted Sasuke-kun's lips was just like the one he'd worn in the Genjutsu Kakashi Sensei had shown her. She trembled as those black flames slithered across Sasuke's pale skin, flinching as he twisted Zaka's arm further simply because he could. She listened to him talk about power, and being an avenger, and a man he'd do anything to kill. She wanted to stop him, wanted to pull him away, but Sakura was afraid to touch him. Sasuke! She said sharply and his head came up, his gaze meeting her own. His eyes were wild again, but this time not with fear. Sasuke stopped this. They're finished. It's over. We weave one, she said, the last word bitter on her tongue. She didn't like the way Sasuke regarded her, but he let Saka go, only to pin the ninja with his foot when he would have stood. He hurt you, Sakura, Sasuke told her. You shouldn't feel sorry for him. Sakura hadn't not until this moment, and it was less that she felt overwhelming pity for the enemy shinobi and more that she was disturbed by Sasuke's actions. He wasn't that stranger she might never see again. He was someone she would thought she'd known. Someone she trusted. She took tiny steps forward, until she was standing at Zaka's head, and she drew him up roughly by his collar, Sasuke moving his foot so she could, and Zaka struggling to gain his own footing. Go, she ordered Zaka curtly and for once all his trash talk seemed to have evaporated. Sasuke's eyes said he didn't like allowing them to retreat and Sakura hurriedly tugged free the last of Kin's Simban, letting them fall to her feet. And then, mastering herself, she hugged him tentatively, making a gentle shackle of her arms. Please, she whispered, let them go. Sakura didn't know if she'd regret sparing them but some deep instinct told her she'd regret it more if she set Sasuke on them while he was like this. She'd feared his abilities once, but this was the first time she'd feared Sasuke himself. This wasn't her teammate, this boy who talked about power regardless of price and looked at the ugly marks seething across his skin like they were some kind of revelation. Orochimaru had said Sasuke would seek him out. She never expected the boy she'd adored to be swayed so easily but even as the marks retreated, she still couldn't make herself feel at ease around him. As she buried her face in the crook of his neck, she just wanted Sasuke-kun back. Chapter 17, Testophobia, Part 1 They'd retrieved Naruto in a tense, awkward kind of silence and Sakura had busied her hands with scavenging all the seven and kanai that littered the field before the two of them had relocated to another location that Sasuke had deemed good enough. Exhausted and hurting, her fear of the nightmares tamped down by sheer physical misery. Sakura had been grateful when Sasuke had broken that silence by gruffly offering to keep watch while she slept. She woke very stiff and disoriented, to find herself guarded by two of Naruto's shadow clones. By the time Naruto and Sasuke returned, there was only one survivor, the other proving that it was quite possible to dispel a clone through blunt force trauma to the head. She was furious, because she still couldn't hear out of one ear. Her body had already begun liberally purpling with bruising before she'd curled up miserably. The wound in her side felt hot and swollen, and she'd fought through pain and fear for them and they'd gone and done something like this. The knowledge that her deafness was likely only a perforated eardrum, a common enough injury in the academy and nothing that medic means couldn't treat, same as her other injuries, didn't make them any less real or frightening in the present. While she'd slept, the pair of them had slunk off to acquire another scroll. And, judging by their expressions, they had been successful and thought that somehow made it better. One of the most infamous nin that ever worn a Kanoha Hittite was targeting Sasuke and they were still taking the exam. 
Naruto might have strutted up like a little bantam game cock ready to crow, but he quailed at Sakura's expression, shrinking behind Sasuke, who looked wary, but stood his ground. Sakura, he said. He tossed the scroll to her, bearing the earth designation. Here. Keep it safe. We're pressing on to the tower. Sakura choked on all the things she wanted to shout at him, because this was the first real gesture of trust he'd ever extended to her. It didn't make her anger vanish, but he'd ruined her momentum and it suddenly became awkward to snarl and rage at him. But awkward or not, compared to facing the Otonin, facing Orochimaru, upsetting Sasuke suddenly seemed so much less dire than it had back in the academy. Once, she'd have done almost anything if she thought it would please Sasuke. She'd have never anticipated as she saw his many faces, learned his moods, worked at his side, what she felt for him would evolve into something that was both less and more. Seeing his pain and vulnerability made her feel strangely possessive and privileged, but when he'd stopped trying to run and turned to fight an enemy despite an overwhelming difference in experience and power over something that didn't really matter. Not like the lives of civilians or teammates, that had been the first time she'd ever thought Uchiha Sasuke could also be a fool. If we make it through to the tower, she asked, what do you intend to do? Huh? Naruto asked, shuffling from behind Sasuke now that it seemed she wasn't going to be yelling at them. What do you mean, Sakura-chan? Of course we're going to make to the third round and give him what for, he said, thumping one fisted hand into the palm of the other. Oh? Sakura said snidely. Maybe I should stop hitting you so hard, because you seem to be overlooking the Sanin targeting Sasuke. Sanin? He repeated blankly. Where? Part of her had been afraid that his response would be along the lines of Sanwat, but it looked like the legendary three had merited more attention than Chakra. If he wasn't so resilient, there were times when Sakura would have filed Naruto in the too dumb to live box. Orochimaru, Sakura replied, sounding out each of the syllables distinctly with the special kind of disdain only teenagers were capable of. Or did you forget the giant snakes? It doesn't matter, Sasuke said, interrupting Naruto's response. Once we reach the tower, this phase of the exam will and will be surrounded by Jounin and Proctors. He won't try anything there. What if he won't have to? And there's still the third phase, she said, trying to temper her tone and not quite managing it. We don't know what that seal does, Sasuke. I think it would be better if we forfeited and you went into protective custody. Her teeth clicked together as his eyes narrowed, for a moment a perfect reflection of the moment before he'd stepped forward and smirked as he broke Sokka's arm, and then gave it a twist just to hear him scream. There was a, something there that hadn't been before. She didn't know if it was danger, or cruelty, or anger, but it spoke to her lizard brain, made her want to go quiet and still and bristle in preparedness to bite back when he struck. Some of this must have shown on her face, because it was Sasuke who flinched and looked away. You're telling me to run. I won't. It's fine, he said stiffly. You shouldn't say anything about it. It's not like the Jounin are blind. If it's really that dangerous, Kakashi will do something to interfere. If she'd been the one marked, that wouldn't have been said with either resentment or certainty. Because she didn't mind being saved and because she'd learned that Kakashi-sensei could be counted on to appear only when you least wanted to see him or didn't particularly need him. And he was really big on consequences being their own lessons. Unless he thought Orochimaru himself was about to erupt through that seal, Kakashi-sensei would leave them to learn from their own mistakes. Sometimes, she wished that their Jounin sensei expected less of them. Sakura maintained a disapproving silence for most of their journey to the tower, which wasn't nearly as harrowing after surviving the giant snakes and Otonin. With Naruto and Sasuke competing with each other like they were in a points match at the academy and eager to make up for the fact that both of them had hardly played a part in the last two battles, she lapsed into something like her old position, but instead of screaming for help when an Aimin tried to grab her, she almost severed his fingers. They did make the tower, one of the last teams to do so, and by that time her suspicion about the unsanitary conditions of a snake's mouth and substandard follow-up had developed into a certainty of infection. But if Sasuke was pretending to not be living on the edge of exhaustion, she could pretend as well. She'd done well enough, having found being partially deaf useful as Naruto nattered on about acquiring the Earth Scroll, 
which apparently involved reckless bravery and the assistance of Kabuto, the silver-haired Nin she'd suspected of being a hidden proctor from the moment she'd seen his ninja data cards. Personnel files weren't that classified, at least at the genin level, but foreign villages didn't like anyone accruing and analyzing data on their ninja, let alone dispensing it freely. And where had he gotten his information, if he was just a genin? Some of their fellow examinees, like Gara, hadn't competed in the exams before, so even Kabuto's previous attempts at the test shouldn't have given him that kind of knowledge. But if he was a hidden proctor, why would he help Sasuke and Naruto? Unless, of course, he had the same sense of humor as Kakashi-sensei and would blithely announce that they'd failed just when they thought they'd won for accepting assistance. Their late arrival meant there was little time for recovery, just a call to form up. Enko, their head proctor, seemed to be just as enthusiastic in heaping abuse on their heads as they formed ranks according to their time of arrival rather than village affiliation as she had when she'd sent them into the forest. After they'd done a roll call, she scowled down at them. What's this? She sneered. I didn't expect this many of you maggots to be staring up at me when we made it here. Some of you probably already know, but there's been a joint decision by village leaders to make this last phase an exhibition match. Show our clients a little of what they're paying for. We wanted to showcase our best and brightest, but it looks like they'll just have to settle for not falling asleep. We don't have enough open slots for all of you, so we're going to have to do some major culling before any of you get any bright ideas about making chunin. So hang tight, ladies, while we decide who we're going to feed to the Inazuka dogs. And maggots? I hear you taking this opportunity to share a little gossip. You're gonna be waiting with your face on the floor and my foot making you eat it. Got that? There was a ragged chorus of affirmative answers. I said you got that? She roared. This time, they managed something more like what she apparently considered a proper response, because she turned on her heel, trench coat flaring dramatically. For a long moment, there was only utter silence, but then it was punctuated by the rustle of clothing as someone shifted restlessly, someone else coughed. Sakura didn't know how long or if someone would work up enough courage to defy Anko's orders, but she took the opportunity to sneak looks at the Jounin instructors ranged along the balcony. Most of them had clustered in group according to village, murmuring to each other in low voices and looking over the assembled genin. Though Kakashi-sensei had no sense of either camaraderie or urgency, leaning against the wall and giving his book his full attention— the green-clad Jounin next to him was apparently undeterred and holding a one-way conversation. She felt her eyebrow twitch. There was no way that particularly appalling fashion statement was a coincidence. She was almost certain this man was Rock Lee's Jounin sensei. Her eyes swept over other groups, until she came to another figure who apparently didn't care for the company. And she felt a chill sweep over her, prickling her scalp and catching at her breathing. The sound note symbol was her first clue but she might have guessed regardless. There was that same sense of gender ambiguity, handsome woman, pretty man, coupled with those two intense eyes. The lips might smile, but it was those eyes that promised to eat you alive. Flak jackets, though his was a slightly more flattering design and color than the Kanoha standard, always minimized the differences usually so obvious in their casual uniforms. But in this case it was mostly the jawline that lent him a certain femininity. Most men didn't have that perfectly tapered V. Otherwise, he might have been the kind of refined Ike men that fell within her strike zone. He looked nothing at all like he had in the forest, but his eyes caught hers and his lips quirked up. Sakura was nowhere near as skilled at reading lips as Eno, who'd turned a hobby for gathering gossip into a useful skill, but she was almost certain he'd said, Am I pretty now? Sakura shuddered hard enough that she drew looks but she fisted her hands and reminded herself to breathe. It would have been better, she thought, if he looked even slightly worried about being caught here. Instead, he still had space to taunt a Jenin who was surprised to have been left alive from their first encounter. He was playing games. Given the stories, he had more than enough battle experience to judge the situation. That he wasn't worried about the Hokage and over two dozen Jounin was so deeply unnerving to it was the same kind of crushing pressure that his killing intent had carried. And somehow, she didn't think it was just a facade. This paralyzed as the fear in the forest hadn't, because the consequences of her actions in this room would be magnified by all the people in it. It wasn't just her life at stake. 
It wasn't even her squad's life at stake. If she revealed him, tried to interfere in whatever game he was playing, she had no doubt his reprisal would be instant and bloody. How many of the genin, standing here with no idea of the snake in their midst, would die? How many of the Jounin sensei would die in defense of their students? It looked like a large room, but if Orochimaru summoned one of his snakes, how many would be crushed even in its death throes? The choice was like a razor-sharp kunai held to her neck. Keep silent, be complicit, and save lives, or open her mouth and condemn everyone. What seemed like the right thing, the proud thing, might not be the good thing for all these people, who might not be involved in his plot. Whatever he wanted, it had to do with Sasuke. Maybe, she thought with a sudden flash of insight, he's testing Sasuke, and that seal, again. After all, the first time. The first time should have left the Otunin team out of the running, but if they were here, they were all either as resilient as Naruto or operating on the kind of loyalty that made zealots into martyrs. She came to a decision then. Even to protect her teammate, she wasn't prepared for the kind of collateral damage that trying to draw attention to his real identity might cause. She wasn't even assured of success. She wanted to believe that the Hokage and the Jounin already knew about him, that for some reason, maybe the same reason she wasn't, they weren't interfering, but her faith in the omnipotence of adults had died in wave, even if she'd survived. He was watching her, and he was enjoying her agony. Sakura bit her tongue and tore her eyes away from Orochimaru's, focusing her eyes in the middle distance just above Sasuke's left shoulder, trying to swallow down her nausea. She never had to make a decision like this before. She shouldn't have to make a decision like this. She was a genin. Her choices should have to do with what to have for breakfast, and hairstyles, and what pair of shoes she wanted to save up to buy. Choices that, if she screwed them up, only affected her. She knew that was only wishful thinking, because she'd just come from a hard lesson on how the actions of one member of the team had repercussions for the whole squad, but she'd come to a limited acceptance of the choices she'd made concerning her path in life. If only life would stop making it so damn hard. Anko returned. Now, she drawled, if it was up to me, we'd have the time and make you run it again, and see who's standing then. But Hokage-sama has decided it's faster to give you a little taste of what you're going to get. Preliminary elimination matches. Half of you are going to be out on your asses by the time this is over, she said, jerking her thumb across her throat in unmistakable threat. All right, maggots, last chance. Surrender now or count yourself willing to be left on the floor in pieces. This one's on your own heads, so don't be looking at your teammates. Sakura was tired and afraid, and her ambition to become Chunin in her first year out of the academy had been crushed beneath the weight of reality and Sasuke and Naruto would be free to do whatever it was they wanted. Her hand trembled a little with the very small weight of regret and shame, but she began to raise it and declare herself out of the exam. Except Sasuke, like he had eyes in the back of his head, snatched her hand without turning and clutched it tight enough her imagination supplied the sound of bones creaking. Don't run away now, he said in a low voice. We've come this far. We've got to finish it. Chapter 18 Testophobia Part 2 The time to surrender passed her by almost without notice as she wrestled with Sasuke's motive for catching her hand and Anko's contemptuous. All right, maggots, clear the floor, washed through her like the shock of bitterly cold water. She wanted to call out wait, but social conditioning pressed down on her almost as hard as her teammates' grip. There was shame and embarrassment waiting there, whereas before it would have been a tactical retreat. And her old pride which she thought trampled by exhaustion and pain and reality, was present enough that she couldn't muster the courage pull a Naruto and demand that Anko let her leave, go home, take a nap and let her teammates face the rest of the exam on their own. She didn't know if he was really brave, or just oblivious, but whichever it was, she wasn't. And there would be another chance soon enough. It wasn't hard to lose a fight. Still, she yanked her hand free of Sasuke's grip and stalked up one of the stairways to where she'd marked Kakashi-sensei earlier. Sakura was careful to not even glance toward Orochimaru, though she had the unsettling sensation of being watched, the fine hairs on her neck prickling. Just paranoia, she told herself. If he looked in their direction, it would be Sasuke he'd be staring at. She was just Ross. 
Kakashi Sensei glanced at her and his brow rose, but he didn't otherwise react. She didn't know why she'd expected anything different. He'd had plenty of time to take in the blood spattered view. Naruto and his need for attention soon turned Kakashi Sensei's gaze elsewhere, and Sakura listened in grim silence as Anko gleefully outlined the rules, which were pretty much the same as the forest. No whining if you ended up dead. If she clenched her jaw any tighter, her molars were going to crack. Sakura let her arms, which had been crossed tightly across her chest, fall limply to her sides. She sidled closer to Kakashi Sensei, ignoring the proctor announcing the first match. Ten Ten, the Kunoichi from Rock Lee's team, and Yoroi Okado. She didn't need to watch. She had no intentions of competing in the third section of the exam and she'd had a belly full of fighting in these days in the forest. Catching Kakashi Sensei's attention, she mouthed bathroom, and he tilted his head toward one of the doors. Turn left when you hit the junction, and don't leave this floor. His tone was serious and Sasakura nodded, accepting it for the warning it was. You didn't build a tower in the middle of a lethal forest for the scenery. You did it because whatever purpose the tower served when not in use in the exams, it needed the clear keep away that the forest of death and its inhabitants provided. Most of the spectators, their attention fixed on the match, didn't even notice as she slunk out the door. And she didn't much care about the ones who did. She found the bathroom just where Kakashi Sensei had said it would be, and after taking care of business, she spent long minutes at the sink scrubbing blood and mud from her skin. Sakura felt anger like a tight, hard knot behind her breastbone as she watched the water swirl down the drain as dirty as she felt. The water was shockingly cold against her flushed face, and when she pulled up her vest to check on what was beginning to feel like a second heartbeat, she flinched when she tugged at the corner of the bandage. Better, she decided after a moment, to let sleeping dogs lie if you don't have any way of putting them down again. There was nothing she could do for her hair, the blood having set as stiff and unflatteringly as overly liberal gel. And her clothes were a mess, she'd either have to burn them or expend a lot of effort to get them clean. It was a real pity that they'd been so expensive, because she'd really have preferred the burning option. If I survive this match, Sakura thought, plucking at the stained fabric of her vest, I am going to thank my mother for doing my laundry for so many years. When she couldn't find anything else to straighten or tidy, and she was only wasting water, she took a deep breath, squared her shoulders and made to return to the arena and nearly barreled someone as she flung open the door and stepped through it with a certainty she didn't feel. Luckily, the near victim was quick on his feet, dancing back out of the way in a movement that seemed somehow playful, hands help up in mock surrender. Ah, he said, recognition breaking across his face. One Isan. You made it to the party after all. Sakura bit her lip to keep back a biting comment about his definition of parties. Thanks again for what you did back there she said instead, because it was the boy from the forest. It came out a little strained, because she was exhausted and bloody and he was wearing those star-shaped barrettes and those two long sleeves and looking like he'd strolled out of the academy after a session with a lecturer with a sense of humor. He shrugged it off. Just took advantage is all. Going back to watch the fights? Sakura nodded. Mind if I come along? The John in processing forms for my teammates recommended the view. There's apparently a ton of paperwork involved in retrieving and removing bodies, he said lightly. Though there are more bits, from what I saw of what the Sandman left behind. There was a that hard, brittle look in his eyes again, at odds with the lightness of his voice. Silly of them, you know, to try something like that while I was scouting. But I got back in time to watch the climax of the show. A little more bloody than yours, Nay-san. That reminds me, did you use my present? Sakura had almost forgotten about the little container, which she tucked away in favor of dealing with Sasuke and hadn't had time to think about since. She fished it out of her pack and was relieved to find it hadn't broken or leaked, the amber substance still safely behind the container walls. I don't even know what it is, she confessed. Or your name, she said with a frown. Amihara Fu. Yours, Wani-san? Harino Sakura. He grinned. See, there is such a thing as serendipity. What I gave you, it's venom. Black Mamba. Sometimes you pick out things you think suit people and there's all different ways of killing in the world, so I thought I'd give you something that matched your style. 
you're clean in your strikes. You don't play around, don't cut just to see someone bleed. So I thought it suited you. Fu unsheathed his own knife and laughed when Sakura tensed. No need to fear, Nei-san. Just look. And she did, because his knife was just as cruel and strange up close as the first time she'd glimpsed it. Long, broad, with that deep, hooked serration she'd noticed before, it was more designed to tear than slash. Despite herself, she moved a little closer. What are those grooves? She asked. They traced from the hilt to the tip of each serrated edge, almost like... Almost like a snake's fangs. They deliver the venom payload, he explained, confirming her suspicions. Venom has to enter the bloodstream to be effective. Provided you don't have ulcers or open sores in your mouth, you can drink the stuff. But you lose potency smearing it on a blade. So there are channels engraved in the metal, and they're sealed with a very thin clear polymer. I'd explain the delivery system, but that's a secret, he said teasingly. I call it reciprocity. Do you have a name for yours? Sakura shook her head slowly, hand coming to rest on the hilt of the damaged knife. No. They're, they're just tools. Like the blades you'd use to cut brush or rice, just people instead. Fu made a thoughtful humming noise deep in his throat. Cold, he said, very cold. They might feel unloved like that. Sakura had no intention of naming the knives she'd taken from the body of a dead man. That poison you used, what was it? He grinned disarmingly, looking startlingly young again. The secret behind the name Reciprocity. The venom I gave you is extremely lethal, but almost painless. Neurotoxin, cardiotoxin. Mostly tingling in your fingers and progressive paralysis until your heart stops. Useful, but not much fun. What I use doesn't kill, just causes pain so extreme that it's debilitating. Pain for pain. I'll admit the source is a little less glamorous. The stonefish doesn't look like much, but stepping on it isn't a mistake you make more than once unless you're too stupid to live. And that's all I have for show and tell today, Wen san Fu sheathed the knife smoothly, then shuffled around behind Sakura so he could shoo her onward, back toward the fights. Sakura protested being herded, but it didn't dissuade him at all, just made his eyes gleam with mischief as they emerged back onto the balcony just in time to see Rock Lee prove that his taijutsu was more than a match for the eerily familiar body manipulation used by Misumi. It didn't matter that the purple-clad genin seemed boneless in his flexibility. Lee's sheer speed made watching the match like watching a wasp kill a caterpillar. Sakura watched with admiration mingled with envy, because there was a smoothness and grace to his movements that she couldn't match even when she wasn't five days into a survival test. Perfect balance, excellent control, clear experience was in his every blow. Some part of her wondered what she looked like when she fought, given that all she seemed to do in training was run away from the Niken and avoid Kakashi-sensei's projectile of the day. She glanced over once to where her teammates were standing and found that knot behind her breastbone tightened. Naruto would have gotten them killed in the encounter with Orochimaru. Sasuke wouldn't respect her decision to surrender. In that moment, Sakura felt nothing but resentment for her team. So she turned away taking the opportunity to glance over at the posted results for the matches she missed. Tanten had won her match and Shikamaru had won the one that followed against Kin. Then the next match was announced, which turned out to be the very definition of the term grudge. It was clear, despite a last-minute rally on Hinata's part, who was going to be the victor of that particular match. Sakura nearly choked on her anger as Naruto cheered her onward into cardiac arrest. Niji's deft and vicious mastery of their shared style not something that could be overcome by something as trite as Naruto's never-say-die philosophy. Her fingers clenched around the railing, which gave a metallic creak of protest that had Fu glancing over at her. She relaxed her grip, unclenched her jaw, and pretended that her increasingly instinctive use of chakra hadn't left indentions of her fingers in a steel rail. But his curiosity turned to something else as two new names blinked into life on the display. Dosa no longer looked disoriented, though any subtlety of expression was lost behind his extensive bandages, but his opponent was the redhead from Suna that had been so unnerving during their brief encounter. It didn't help that Fu sucked in a breath and murmured, Enter Sandman. What came next would be something that would be forever etched on her memory, 
because if there was an imbalance in skill between Niji and Hinata, the distance between Gara and Dosu was a chasm. Dosu was not an incapable ninja, she admitted grudgingly as she watched him press forward, confident in his ninjutsu, but Gara, Gara was a monster. He never moved, never seemed to breathe, hardly seemed to blink. Just stood there, sand dampening all Dosu's sound waves, and then all that sand reached out like the hand of a god and crushed Dosu. There was a short, short scream, then blood was seeping through the sand, the crowd so silent she almost imagined she heard it dripping to the floor. Gara didn't preen or gloat. He just released a lump of twisted flesh and broken bone to floor with a wet-sounding thump and walked away, rejoining his team as if this was just another exercise at the academy. As if he hadn't just slaughtered someone without ever lifting a hand. What made it bad was that not a flinch of surprise was displayed by his teammates, or his jounin sensei, although she thought it might be disgust that twisted the kunoichi's lips into a grimace. But not like someone seeing someone terrible, like a housewife catching sight of a dirty floor. What made it worse was that Sakura's name was the next to be illuminated on the board, and her opponent was that kunoichi from sand, who looked so composedly on the thing that until a minute ago had been a person. They had to wait for them to clean the floor and even when it was pronounced fit for use, there was a fine layer of bloody sand that they'd need to wash from the concrete later. Some part of her brain wondered if they had drains built into this floor for just this circumstance. The rest of her mind was considering what it might mean to lose to this kunoichi. The sand made a sound beneath her boots as she walked to take her place in the center of the floor, like a scritching, like something ugly crawling beneath the loam. Temari, that was her name, didn't have the smooth, glossy prettiness of a Kanahagakur kunoichi. She was hard, sharp, prickly, like the foliage native to Suna, which might have been its own kind of beauty. What it told Sakura was that this was someone else who also survived and that this battle would be like the bridge, like the forest. And when Temari smirked, Sakura let any thought of losing intentionally slip away. She didn't know if she could win, but she wasn't going to end up like Dosu. And if that meant that Temari had to die, well, she could live with that. Chapter 19 Testophobia, Part 3 Temari opened her mouth, and Sakura unsheathed her knives as the proctor's hand fell, darting forward before the final syllable fell silent. Temari's eyes widened slightly at Sakura's speed, but her blades never touched skin. In the time it took to cover the scant feet between them, the other kunoichi somehow managed to wedge that unwieldy length of metal she'd been wearing on her back between herself and Sakura. It was wide enough and long enough to protect her core and Sakura snarled in frustration, because that familiar litany of larynx, spine, lungs, liver, jugular, subclavian artery, kidneys, heart might have been a to-do list like grocery shopping for Zabuza, but if her first strike failed, she would have to really work for her victory. And she was just so damn tired. A strange, shrieking snarl escaped her as she threw herself forward, hands pressed briefly together as her image flickered and splintered, producing three versions of Sakura. Temari's lips twisted into a fierce, competitive grimace as she flipped her fan open and swept it parallel to the floor in a waist-high sweep. Shearing winds extended the reach of sharpened steel ribs, and that invisible blade tore through all the visible Sakura clones, but the real one, invisible beneath Genjustu, slid beneath the blow, managing to unbalance Temari as her foot impacted her ankle. Sakura cursed herself, because she'd meant to sweep both her feet, but concrete was not conductive to sliding. The skin between her boots and shorts throbbed as the wound in her side screamed, but she ignored it as she tried to prize open Temari's defenses. Launching herself up from the floor, she thought she could take advantage of any counterattack Temari might make, but counter to her expectations, Temari turned her stumble into a retreat. More cautious than her teammate, Sakura registered, more dependent on distance to keep the advantage. Dependence on her wind ninjutsu, rather than hand-to-hand -hand skill. Sakura couldn't know it wasn't lack of skill, only reasonable caution. Temari was no fool. She'd seen Sakura when she'd come in, seen how quick she was to pull her knives, and came to the correct conclusion. This wasn't an opponent she'd let close on her. Temari sent another gust of wind roaring toward Sakura and Sakura imagined it was like trying to stand against a hurricane blast. Little bits of dirt, grit, 
and debris scoured her skin and only tenacity and chakra manipulation kept her upright. Her eyes watered, and it burned to breathe, but she only tucked in her chin, she the knife, and pulled her shamak up over her nose, using chakra to keep it in place rather than freeing a hand to retie it. Then her knife was in her hand and she was advancing like a thirteen-year cicada cycle, slow and ponderous, but inevitable. It was almost as bad as fighting beneath the bridge had been, because there was no point at which it was safe to have both feet off the floor. And that was more than just inconvenient when Temari's next blast of shearing wind was suddenly full of whirling shuriken that buzzed like enraged hornets. She had a microsecond to decide to hold ground, which would mean choosing what hits to take, or to fall back. Sakura chose to hold, contorting her body in such a way as to minimize her profile, the sharp bark of metal against metal marking the shuriken she struck out of the air. The rest dealt her only glancing wounds, which given their speed and sharpness, hardly hurt at all. Sakura lunged forward in the silent wake of the wind, Tamari's eyes widening as she slammed her fan shut, using it to block Sakura's strikes. And Sakura, with her double knives, had to swallow down a curse as their battle became a kind of high-stakes dance with a lightning-fast tempo. One good blow to the fan would be enough to ruin the edge of her knife forever. One good strike would be enough to end Tamari forever. She pressed harder, one of her knives catching a glancing blow on the flat that sent it spinning out of her hand. Sakura roared, empty hand curling into a fist and slamming against the barrier of the fan. The metal screeched in protest, buckling, but her hand was on fire with the dozen tiny breaks of a boxer's fracture. Tamari's eyes widened in incredulous disbelief, but kept up her defense as Sakura tried to press the advantage. In her determination to keep going despite the pain, she overlooked her own defense, and a hard kick in the gut from Tamari sent her staggering back and she couldn't recover in time to keep herself from being clipped by another gust. It tore open a long gash on her arm, but these days Sakura had new standards for pain. So she just sheathed her knives and folded her fingers into an increasingly familiar set of signs, feeling the pulse of chakra that marked the hook of the hell-viewing jutsu setting deep. As Tamari's eyes caught on the ghost, a woman, Sakura's hands folded the second genjutsu, which rendered her invisible again because she too was an item in the environment, her hand unerringly traveling to Fu's gift, uncapping it, and ever so carefully watching death drip onto the discolored steel of her remaining knife. It took only moments, the container capped again and tucked away, then she was sprinting forward, edging into that place where she was moving so fast she couldn't see. Perhaps she'd grown overconfident in the Megan, Narakumi no Jutsu. Kakashi-sensei had warned her once that the genjutsu provoked fear and horror, and that some people reacted to that very differently. But there were dead men between that statement and this battle, men who'd frozen up and seated that one necessary second. Tamari, somehow sensing her invisible rush, looked directly at her, her eyes wet with tears but burning in rage. Sakura's only comfort as the wide metal bat of Tamari's folded fan impacted against her skull was that she'd flipped her wrist around in time opening a wide laceration down the other Kunoichi's arm as she drew her weapon back for a second blow. If I'm dead, she thought fuzzily, so is she. Kill your heroes. Kakashi had internally winced at the sound of that long length of steel impacting his student's skull, and he could only hope that second blow across her back hadn't shattered vertebrae. The Suna Kunoichi sneered down at her, then took two steps back and glared expectantly at the proctor. He obligingly called the match. Medics swarming toward Sakura and Kakashi stood up from his slouch against the wall, making his way down into the pit to make certain that his student would still be his student after some time with the medic Nin. One of the medics glanced up at him as he drew close. What exactly have you been teaching your students, Hataki? He demanded. Kakashi had memorized the faces, if not the names, of all the medical personnel in the village, the better to elude them, so he wasn't surprised to recognize him. But he was surprised to recognize the expression on his face, which was one which normally only escaped when he thought Kakashi had done something terminally stupid on an ANBU mission. I have no idea what you mean, he said blithely. I mean your student is well on her way to a nice case of sepsis, so I have no idea what business you thought she had entering this match to start with. But I suppose you might be glad to know that aside from that and the nasty wound in her side that started it, a perforated eardrum, some major fractures in her hand, 
bone bruising across her shoulder blades, and a concussion. There's nothing much wrong with her. Well, that's comforting to know, Kakashi said after a significant pause, recalling how Sasuke had grabbed Sakura's hand. He suppressed a sigh and wondered bleakly if his team had been this much of a burden to Minato. Doubtful, he decided as he watched the medics load Sakura onto a stretcher. Is Sakura-chan going to be okay? Naruto asked anxiously as he returned to the balcony. Kakashi let his eyes trail over to Sasuke, who was listening intently and trying to disguise it by keeping his eyes on the pit. Unless I miss my guess, he said lightly, taking into consideration her decision to stand with a foreign neen, she's going to be very angry, but otherwise she's going to make a full recovery. Naruto's brows drew together. You mean about losing the fight? I mean, that was kind of... Kakashi held up a hand to forestall hearing whatever Naruto thought of the fight. We're going to talk about this later, he told both of his students. For now, concentrate on your matches. The next match saw Ino turn Zaka's need to gloat into a trap. His monologue as he held her by hair with his one functional arm more than enough time for her to snatch control of his body. The spirit of a Yamanaka might move slowly and only in straight lines, but at point-blank range. It was a matter of seconds to have his body surrender. Sasuke's name came up next in the draw, against Inazuka Kiba, which wouldn't have worried him in the normal course of things. Except that the ugly chakra that crawled out of a seal and spilled across Sasuke's skin wasn't anywhere near the normal course, nor was Sasuke's grudging agreement to seal it. And because he was Hitaki Kakashi and his life sometimes felt like some tragic farce, Orochimaru himself stepped out of the shadows and wanted to talk. It was like trying to tap dance in a minefield, talking with one of the most notorious ninja to have ever worn the leaf. A ninja who apparently had less than perfectly altruistic intentions toward one of his students. He'd known that having the last Uchiha on his team would mean protecting him and his Kekiagenkai from those who'd like to possess it. He just hadn't anticipated that it was something that the first major threat would come from one of the Sanin. Kakashi didn't let himself relax when Orochimaru turned to leave, so he didn't tense when he paused and halfway turned back to him, those eerie yellow eyes focused on him again. Haruno Sakura, she is a genjutsu type? Why should it matter? Kakashi countered warily. A swift smile. Curiosity. One shouldn't overlook unexpected treasures simply because they aren't what you set out to find. I expect it will be a difficult path for her. After all, so few role models to follow. So little you can teach her. So many other demands on your time. I wonder if anyone has told her that the two most recent genjutsu types of any note that this village has produced were Uchiha Itachi and myself? No? He asked when Kakashi kept silent. All or is ugly. It only matters whether it's worth the effort to refine. If you can't be bothered, you should find someone who can. You? Kakashi asked tightly. That prompted that low, unsettling chuckle. Not me. Some animals are too dangerous to raise. And with that he was gone and Kakashi was left to wonder just what had happened in that forest. He scrubbed a hand through his hair and made his way back to the pit, crossing paths with the foreign Nin who'd been standing with Sakura. The boy, hands hidden by his two long sleeves, was trying unsuccessfully to stifle his laughter. He glanced up at Kakashi as he passed and for the second time that day, he met Citrin eyes. He pulled his hands away from his mouth long enough to say, when he sent bit her, before he dissolved into another fit of sniggering and disappeared down the hall. He emerged onto the balcony just in time to hear the Sunanin yelling for a medic. Their Kunoichi, the one who'd been Sakura's opponent not more than twenty minutes ago, had lost the ability to talk and was swiftly losing consciousness. Poison was the diagnosis of the attendant medic Neen, who swept her out of the arena to the murmurs of the watching crowd. Just what the hell happened in that forest? If that was the thought that occupied him throughout the rest of the exam, leaving him with just enough presence of mind to desultorily congratulate Naruto on his victory against Chuji and watch as Shino undermined the Suna Puppet Master's technique by the very simple practical measure of setting his kikechu to feast on the chakra strings needed to manipulate the puppets, and then setting them to devour chakra from the fingers up. By the time he was shoulder-deep in writhing beetles, the Sunanin had conceded the match. Kakashi waited impatiently for the match-up for the next section to be announced, and almost the instant they were finished, 
he herded his gen into the room the medic Neen had placed Sakura for treatment. It seemed like it was time for a discussion. And if he had to make them sit vigil at Sakura's bedside until she was ready to participate in it, well, he was a little put out with all of them at the moment. Chapter 20 Allodoxophobia Kakashi kept silent until Naruto was all but squirming in his seat, while Sasuke attempted to give some impression of alertness rather than run out exhaustion. Ne any Kakashi sensei can I? He cut Naruto off. No. But I. No, Naruto. Tuchi's business won't collapse if you don't get celebratory ramen. Instead, why don't you tell me a story, he prompted, keeping his tone that lightly mocking, unreadable calm that had served him well since his father had fallen from grace. Untouchable, it said without saying, indifferent. And mostly it was the truth. He'd stopped investing himself in people at the same time he'd stopped believing that heroes were infallible. Unfortunately, this team was different. He owed Minato and he promised Sarutobi and the Niken were awfully fond of Sakura. Just thinking of it made him tired. A story, sensei? Naruto asked incredulously. Even Sasuke darted a disbelieving glance at him. Yes, a story. Unless it actually was raining blood while I wasn't looking and Sakura just happened to be caught in a sudden shower. In which case, feel free to keep silent. And yes, Naruto, that is sarcasm. I'm not willing to wait for a written report. The two of you are going to tell me what happened in the forest. Naruto and Sasuke shared a glance, and it was unsurprisingly his blonde charge who took the lead, Sasuke only interrupting when Naruto got carried away. Or when he'd been absent and he'd been absent for things that made it difficult to keep up his expression of neutrality. And when Naruto re-entered the story, he stopped trying. Naruto, he interrupted the blonde, sounding out the syllables of his name with exacting preciseness. What made you think it was a good idea to charge ahead when your enemy is clearly more powerful than you are? Even if Sasuke had given him the scroll, he wouldn't have let us go anyway, Naruto protested indignantly. I didn't ask about the scroll, Naruto. Sasuke could have burnt the scroll himself or pitched it. I don't care. I want to know why you thought it was acceptable to stay and fight at all. Naruto had that kick-dog look, the one that said he didn't understand what he was being scolded for. But Kakashi was in no mood to spare his feelings. We couldn't. We couldn't just run. I'm not a scaredy cat, Naruto said, looking inexplicably betrayed. And who knows if we could have even made it anyway. Kakashi's voice was hard as sharp-edged as his kunai, when he spoke again. Naruto, there is a fine line between being a hero and being the fool who got everyone slaughtered because he couldn't tell the difference between a battle worth fighting and one that was over before it ever started. And you crossed it. There are reasons to fight losing battles, but you didn't have any of them. You weren't holding the line, you weren't making some noble martyr sacrifice for the cause, you weren't protecting anyone. Frankly, I don't even know what you were doing. Was it a pride thing? Here was your best opportunity for some one-upmanship Sasuke and you just couldn't resist driving it home that you were brave enough to fight and he wasn't? Explain it to me, so I can tell you to never do it again. Those that abandon their teammates are trash, Naruto, but a person who makes their teammates decide between abandoning them or facing a fight that's too much for them to handle? That's something worse than trash. I want you to think about how you'd have felt if Sakura died, or Sasuke just because you thought you could go toe-to-toe with someone who you should have recognized as a major threat. A gamut of emotions had run across Naruto's expressive features, indignation, anger, guilt, and his eyes looked suspiciously shiny as he stared down at his clenched hands. Kakashi didn't feel even reflexive guilt. Thanks to the Kyuubi's regenerative properties, it was impossible that pain would teach Naruto caution. It was easy to be fearless when even fractured bones healed within the day but it was likely that if he wasn't set right now, he'd assume that his teammates could take just as much punishment as he did with as little consequence. And Kakashi knew where that would lead. Courage had its place, but he knew exactly what overconfidence could cost a team. It was a measure of how seriously they were taking this that Sasuke wasn't smirking at Naruto, was instead staring very steadily at the rail of Sakura's hospital bed. He considered what he might say to him that he hadn't said already. But if Sasuke didn't already realize that Orochimaru was bad news, and that probably needed to be in blazing capital letters, 
it would take more than just words to change his mind. But if he couldn't address Orosimaru, he could address the other issue. So Sasuke, and he was satisfied to see the genin in question flinch almost imperceptibly, is there a reason that you wouldn't let Sakura forfeit? Sasuke wouldn't meet his eyes and he mumbled his response. What was that? Because I thought she could do it, Sasuke repeated, his words edged in irritation that likely came from embarrassment if the faint flush at the tips of his ears is anything to go by. And I didn't want to go into it with just the dead last. You didn't know she was hurt? Sasuke hesitated then, I didn't think she was hurt that badly. She didn't say anything. When we were at the academy, you could always hear Sakura and Ino complaining if they got too roughed up during practical. And you didn't think that she might have matured since then? Kakashi asked dryly. Sasuke scowled and dropped his gaze. Not that much, he grumbled. She was always trying to get my attention. She should have said something. Kakashi remembered vaguely that the same someone who told him that there was a phase when girls would be more interested in boys than in training had also told him that that was the same time they started keeping secrets, and while they would outgrow the boys, they'd never outgrow the secrets. He was beginning to believe them. I'll give you one very good piece of advice about women, Sasuke. What they say out loud is only about 30% of the message. I like that you have confidence in Sakura's skills, but you might want to put a little bit more trust in her judgment especially as it relates to her own body. Naruto was staring at Sasuke. Wait, you stopped her from forfeiting? Back when Scary Lady in the fishnet stockings was giving the give up now speech? So? Sasuke retorted. Naruto's brows furrowed. I don't think Sakura should have given up then either, but it's kind of weird that you would even care. She's my teammate, Sasuke replied defensively. I'm your teammate. You're an idiot. Stop squabbling, Kakashi chided them. He was met with obedience and recalcitrant expressions, but both of them seemed subdued. Naruto rubbed at the back of his head in an awkward gesture, then asked, Hey, Kakashi-sensei? Yes? Did Sakura-chan, I mean, did she mean to you know, poison Tamari? How do you accidentally poison someone? Sasuke muttered scathingly. Let some people near a kitchen and you can find out. Kakashi thought, but kept it to himself. He didn't want to break the tone of this conversation, not when Naruto was taking it seriously. Kakashi considered downplaying the poisoning, but decided that enough was enough. This was like Sakura and Fire, all over again. If he didn't acclimate them now to the idea that their female teammate was their equal, it might burn them in live combat. They might be stronger physically, though Sakura was rapidly gaining ground and would always be her better when it came to raw chakra, but she'd learned a very different lesson on that bridge than her two teammates. It put her in a very different place, emotionally and developmentally. That thought made him feel faintly guilty, but it wasn't a fresh, cutting guilt, just a resurgence of the old regret that poisoned everything. Just another person he'd failed to protect. There was a private memorial in his mind, one that he revisited in spirit when his body couldn't be at the one carved in unforgiving stone. Naruto, what did you think of Sakura's battle? Naruto hesitated, which told Kakashi that he hadn't been completely oblivious to the change in Sakura's behavior. For himself, the moment he'd seen her expression, he'd known exactly what was in store for the other Chunin candidate. And given what the Kunoichi's teammate had done, he didn't know that he'd have reacted any differently. Uh, well, it was more aggressive than Sakura-chan usually is, Naruto said at last. I mean, the proctors all begin and Sakura's all like swoosh and she's got those knives out. Where did she get those knives, anyhow? And she, um, looked kinda scary. Kinda like she wanted to kill Tamari, he ventured hesitantly. There's no kinda. If we hadn't had medical staff on site, Tamari would have died, Kakashi said flatly, deftly ignoring the question about the knives. He could see the struggle on Naruto's face as he tried to reconcile his Sakura-chan with someone who would make that kind of decision. Sasuke's expression was harder to read. Maybe she didn't know how bad the poison was. Naruto ventured hopefully. She was the one saying it was just a test. Sakura-chan wouldn't kill someone for that. Not for a test, but when someone's teammate slaughters someone in broad daylight for a test and your opponent doesn't flinch, 
that might be a good indication that she doesn't share your values system. And Sakura wasn't willing to die for a test either. She could have forfeited, Sasuke remarked. She could have. If she'd been thinking clearly, she might have. But from what the medic Neen told me, her fever was already bad going into the fight. When it's life or death, a kind of tunnel vision that only accepts one outcome isn't that unusual. Sakura wasn't going to die, so Tamari had to. A harder edge crept into his voice. And failing that, she was going to make certain no one survived. Why? Sasuke asked after a long, charged moment. That's not like Sakura at all. It is like Sakura, just not the Sakura you remember from the academy. Which she hasn't been. Not for a while. The two of you need to recognize that. Kill your heroes. Pain medication was good in the sense that without it the bruises the medic Neen had left to heal in their own good time throbbed enough to make her miserable, bad in the sense that it made thinking difficult, like her brain was functioning at half speed. Just fast enough to understand she was in trouble, not fast enough to produce excuses. But grumpy and defensive, she didn't feel much like giving them either. She'd woken to only Kakashi-sensei in the room, though he'd remarked wryly that he'd made Sasuke and Naruto stay until Naruto had almost taken out some very expensive medical equipment when he toppled out of his chair. That was fine with Sakura. She didn't want them here anyway. Her fingers clutched at the thin blanket as she tried to swallow down her anger. Poison is something new for you, Kakashi-sensei said in that light, leading way he had. They managed to save her, in case you're wondering. Sakura frowned, filled with a very peculiar dichotomy of feeling. One part of her was relieved, because the fight was over and no one had died. That part felt a little guilty, because in retrospect it was clearer that Temari hadn't intended to turn the match into a duel to the death. She'd had the chance and hadn't taken it, even though she'd still been caught in Sakura's genjutsu when she dealt that final blow. The rest of her was afraid. If it had ended with the match, it would have been one thing. But she'd used Fu's gift and Tamari had survived. Now there was a primal part of her brain insisting that leaving enemies alive was a very, very bad thing and her world would not be safe and right again until she fixed the problem. Her hands trembled on her covers and her blood pressure spiked on her monitor, either of which she noticed until Kakashi-sensei's voice cut through the tightening spiral of her thoughts. Sakura. Calm down. Her eyes met his one, hers wide and panicked, his narrow with intensity. Kakashi-sensei, she gasped through the tightness in her chest, what do I do? Do? About what? Temari. What is she? He held up a hand to forestall her. Stop. I think I know where you're going with that. And you need to stop. Take a deep breath. She did as he instructed and her trembling quieted a little. Temari is from Suna. And Suna, in our line of work, is synonymous with poison. It helps that every third animal and second plant in their territory is poisonous, which they've used to their advantage in the past and will continue to in the future. Her teammate is a puppet master whose every needle, blade, and odd projectile doesn't see the field without a good coating of something unpleasant. It also means she's unlikely to hold a grudge about your use of it. From the sound of it, she was more upset with herself for not noticing it immediately. Sakura's brows furrowed, trying to understand this alien point of view. How long did it take for her to notice it? A little less than twenty minutes. Venom doesn't work as well with open cuts, the blood flow means less of it gets into the bloodstream to do its business. And because your match ended immediately, her heart rate slowed as well, which gave her more time before the effects became noticeable. In the field, it might have worked regardless. With Black Mamba, you're unlikely to last more than six hours. And only about one of those conscious. Now, with that said, Black Mamba aren't native to Kanahigakura, and if it's a shopkeeper who sold it to you, Someone is about to get their license revoked. Where did you get the venom? It was a gift, Sakura admitted. From someone I met in the forest. Kakashi's brow soared. And you used it? He told me what it was, Sakura said, staring down at her clenched hands. I knew what type of venom it was. And what it did. I just didn't expect for it to take so long to work. So you chose to try to kill Tamari? Yes, Sakura admitted softly. Because I thought she'd kill me if I didn't kill her first. 
All right, Kakashi-sensei said after an unnerving pause. She looked up at him disbelievingly. That's it, just all right? Sakura, he said patiently, every shinobi in that room had already signed a waiver that accepted the possibility that their match might end with them dead. You saw that in action when that Otonin went against Gara. You were within your rights to make that decision. But you also have to live with that decision. As long as you do that, I won't say anything. You're a genin now, which means more freedom to make your own decisions. And I recommended you for Chunin, which would have seen you making decisions for a squad. I'm not your parent, nor am I one of your academy instructors. I am your mentor and you are a working professional. Unless your judgment endangers you or others or violates the code, I won't tell you whether you're right or wrong. Every shinobi has to draw their line in the sand, decide what they will and won't do to achieve an end. I guess that makes sense, Sakura said after a long pause. Kakashi-sensei chuckled. I'd hope so. Now you're free to leave whenever you feel up to it. Naruto and Sasuke both won their rounds she felt less about that than she probably should, but there was nothing even resembling jealousy inside her at the news, so we're not going to be meeting up for regular training. I'll be taking care of Sasuke's training personally, so someone else will be handling you and Naruto for the interim. His grinned, his eyes shifting into the familiar crescent that boded ill for everyone. And, Sakura? Don't think that a few bruises gets you out of walking the Niken. Chapter 21, Counterphobia Sakura left when Kakashi-sensei did, though the enormous, ugly bruise across her shoulder blades protested her decision. It was still preferable to the unnerving feeling that at any moment someone might appear at her door and make the windowless, sterile room her grave. Temari, despite Kakashi-sensei's assurances. Temari's teammate, with the soulless eyes and all that crushing sand. Orochimaru. That thought made her walk a little closer to Kakashi-sensei, her gaze skittering nervously over the people they passed in the halls. He could be anyone, the paranoid part of her brain insisted, to which the rational part retorted, you aren't worth the trouble. She tried to believe the rational voice, but she was still raw from the inexplicable turn of events in the forest of death. Nothing in her career seemed to be going as it should, so why would this be anything different? Sakura, if I stop suddenly, I'm going to have to peel you off my elbow, Kakashi-sensei said wryly. I wasn't going to interrogate you like I did the boys, but I'm listening if there's something you want to tell me. She worried her lip, sparing one last anxious glance around the entrance as they left the tower, which seemed even more ominous with the on-site medical facilities, then rapidly recounted everything that had happened in the forest in a voice that was hardly more than a whisper. The Jounin were keeping a corridor out of the forest clear of predators, which made their exit much easier than the journey in, and there was nothing to distract her from her story. Kakashi-sensei was silent until she'd finished, which was just as well, because once she started talking, she couldn't seem to stop. She had to swipe at her eyes with the palm of her hand, but it wasn't just fear, but also rage and frustration and disappointment, all tangled together. Not just Orochimaru, but Naruto and Sasuke and all the rest, even though she tried hard to swallow back the bitterness, it felt so good to finally say it aloud. Her breathing was slightly ragged when she'd finished, but she'd never raised her voice, not once. And while there'd been tears, she hadn't outright cried either, even though telling Kakashi-sensei about being inside the mouth of the snake had been like relieving it. Her excellent memory, so useful elsewhere, kept supplying the scent and the sound and the feel of it her stomach clenching reflexively at the that weightless, waiting for the pain moments of being suspended in space. But she'd soldiered through, came to the tower and Temari and brought it to a clean end. Now she glanced up nervously at Kakashi-sensei, who was frowning intently, but when he noticed her attention he raised his brows in that sardonic way of his, twisting his mouth into a wry grin. Let's just agree that when you retake the exam, you don't go so far out of your way to impress S-class missing me. Impress? I sealed Sasuke's little memento, and Orikimura came calling after I'd finished. Didn't seem too perturbed by the ceiling, which was a little unsettling, but he had good things to say about you. Sakura was at first dubious, because Kakashi sensei taught life lessons by exposing Genin to horrifying Genjutsu, but then she realized he was serious. It felt like every fine hair on her body stood to attention in its follicle, 
because being mentioned by Orochimaru meant being taken notice of by Orochimaru. That was high on her list of do not want, because it seemed to stand in opposition to her immediate life goal, which was live another day. She clasped her forearm hard enough to hurt, gritting her teeth against the shudder that racked her body. That's really bad, Kakashi-sensei. I agree. But it didn't sound like he was interested in recruiting you, if that's any comfort. We'll have to keep an eye on Sasuke, though. The dubiousness returned as she glanced sidelong at Kakashi-sensei. Don't worry, he reassured her. I'm not asking you to engage Orochimaru in a fight, just to make certain that Sasuke runs. How? He only listens to Naruto, she muttered. Genjutsu if you have to, was Kakashi-sensei's immediate reply. Rest assured, whatever you show him will be much, much preferable to what Orochimaru is capable of. Sakura thought through the implications of that, that her hell-viewing jutsu was preferable, and was not reassured by this permission to turn her techniques against her teammate. But she reassured herself, for the next month, it was Kakashi-sensei's responsibility to watch after Sasuke and someone else's to look after Naruto. Perhaps after that, her anger might have faded, Naruto once again merely irritating in Sasuke. Well, she hoped that one day she'd glance over at him and not the exultant expression on his face as he broke Sokka's arm. Kill your heroes. The Niken had at least allowed her to return home and shower after their morning walk, since she was scheduled to meet her interim sensei and wanted to make an impression that did not involve mud and dog slobber. The dog hair was a lost cause, so she ignored the way her clothing below her waist seemed to accumulate it like it had magnetic properties. She was down to only Bull and Packin, the latter of whom catching a ride on the larger dog's head, while Bull had his mouth full of a scroll case. Instructions for your feeding and care, Packin said when he noticed the direction of her gaze. Kakashi-sensei didn't tell my mentor what he wanted him or her to teach me himself. That's not the boss's way, Packin said. This way, if there's something they don't like, they don't have a chance to argue with it. At least not in person. Kakashi-sensei, the path to conservation of effort, Sakura remarked dryly, which caused Packin to chuckle. That's about the way of it. So who is my sensei? She prodded. That would be telling, kid. Besides, we're almost there. Almost there was a neat little eatery that Kakashi-sensei had tricked her into treating him at, once, the memory of which made her scowl as she came in the door and was welcomed by the wait staff. There were lattice screens separating the booths, which lent everything had an air of privacy, but made it hard to pick out anyone even if she'd known who she was looking for. Luckily, Bull seemed to know the way and the eatery, like most places that catered to ninja, had a relaxed policy when it came to ninja animals. Their destination turned out to be a booth in the back corner with a view of both doors, the paranoia stall, as it was teasing referred to, though beneath the humor was a tacit understanding that that seat belonged to whichever Jounin was the first to be seated. Kakashi-sensei apparently felt that unobstructed views of the exits were overrated. His requirement was good light and quick service, which usually saw them seated at the bar or near the kitchen. The Jounin seated at the booth was occupied with chatting up the waitress as they approached, so they had to wait until she'd taken her leave before Sakura could duck into a neat bow and introduce herself. There was a beat as the Jounin considered her, the Senban in his mouth flicking almost irritably, something echoed by the furrow of his brow. But then it smoothed out, and she was left with a sardonically grin that seemed more earnest than Kakashi-sensei's expression. Genma Shiranui, he introduced himself. Kakashi called in some favors and uncollected bets, and I'm in the village to provide extra manpower for the duration of the exams anyway, so here I am. Sit. He indicated the bench opposite him with a tilt of his head and Sakura nervously seated herself. I took a look at your records already and I know all about your performance in the exams. Perfect score on the first section, a loss in the second that was avenged in a nasty way. But I don't know what exactly Kakashi wants me to teach you. That was Bull's cue to plop the scroll case on the table and after looking in distaste at the drool-slick surface, Genma-sensei opened it. His eyebrows swept up as he unrolled it, which Sakura felt didn't bode well, but it was Kakashi-sensei. She hadn't expected anything else. Frankly speaking, if there was a chance she'd be meeting with Orochimaru again, she'd take twice his usual torture and like it. 
Shit, then Ma Sensei said with feeling. He's got a list of assigned readings in here as long as my arm. Some of them you need to be a Jounin just to take out of the archives. Real heavy on chakra theory and manipulation and Jinjutsu. Looks like, and enough anatomy texts to qualify you as a hunter Nin in Mizu. As for physical training, looks like you'll be working with his dogs in the morning for stamina training, which is good. I'm not a morning person. Work on your knife work, all right. Wants to press your limits with your projector weapons, says your aim degrades too much when you're working at speed. Again, pretty basic. What is not basic, and really is just this side of crazy, is that he wants you to be able to do full speed shunshin by the time I return you to him. Is shunshin that unusual? Sakura asked timidly. For your first year out of the academy? If you're any kind of prodigy, maybe not, but this seems like it might be a little much for you. Sakura is already capable of the basic movement, Pakin replied. She just needs work on fine-tuning her chakra manipulation so that when she enhances her ability to perceive rapid movement she doesn't fry her ocular nerve in the process. Really? Gemna Sensei asked skeptically. Because that wasn't in. His voice trailed off and then he shook his head ruefully. Sorry, Sakura, he apologized. I should know better than to expect Kakashi to be completely explicit in your personnel files. He's a cagey bastard with his own abilities. No need to expect anything different when it comes to your record-keeping. A little more thorough on your teammates, but there's more people looking over his shoulder when it comes to them. His lips quirked up like that was a joke, but Sakura couldn't follow his humor. I don't know when he expects you to sleep with this kind of workload, but we'll do our best. But first, breakfast. Working with Gunma sensei turned out to be a very different experience from working with Kakashi-sensei. His humor was less edged, less sardonic, and more abundant, which made learning under him more like exercises out of the academy and less like Kakashi senseis prepare you for life if you survive its style that had become the norm for their sessions since Wave. But Dinma was also very, very good at what he did, at least on the armed and unarmed combat side of things, though he readily confessed to being good only at breaking Jinjutsu. Which was fine. He hadn't been lying when he talked about Kakashi senseis reading list much of which had to be tackled with notepaper and dictionary in hand, even if most of them were short treatises rather than full-size books. But this was one area at least where Sakura had complete confidence, and she enjoyed the challenge to her mind, setting to her assignments with a pleasure she didn't usually feel when doing physical training. Her motto for that was more suffering today, for less suffering tomorrow, but she was greedy for the knowledge. Even when that knowledge was endless diagrams of eyes and chakra flow, and all the ways she could end up permanently blinding herself when using shunshin if she misdirected the flow even fractionally or kept up the enhancement too long. They were more than midway through the month when Gima sensei was called away during one of their training sessions and Sakura knew something was wrong when he sent a note calling off the rest of the lesson. Unlike Kakashi sensei, Gima sensei, for all his humor, took his responsibilities very seriously. It had been strangely unnerving to have her sensei arrive before her to their training field. Because she didn't receive any word to the contrary, she showed up at their training field on time and found a strangely sober Genma sensei waiting for her. But he wasn't alone. Hey, Sakura, he greeted her. Genma sensei. Genma sensei's samban flicked as he considered her, then he sighed. All right, I've been checking out books under my name and letting you use them. I suppose I can trust you to be circumspect. We had an incident last night. Hate, he's the one who proctored the selection round after the second round, is dead. And I've been appointed proctor of the third exam, which means I'll be taking on extra duties. Ergo, less time for you. But Rado has agreed to lend some of his time and help us out. He'll be training you with your knives. He grinned. It's about the only thing he's better than me at so we have to let him enjoy the chance to show off when it comes around. The other man, Rado, rolled his eyes silently. He was one of the few Jounin Sakura had ever seen with facial scarring, well-heeled but with thick ridges of scar tissue that swept across the bridge of his nose and widened in their path along his cheek. Otherwise he had a certain no-nonsense sort of look, his hair cropped short and with no personal modifications to his uniform. I'll be in your care, Sakura said politely. Rado nodded. From what Genma tells me, you're easy to work with. 
My specialty is Kenjutsu, so I can give you a good grounding in how to approach an opponent using a blade with superior reach. I didn't have any notice, so I didn't have time to clear my mission schedule. You'll have occasional afternoons to yourself. If you want my recommendation, fill them up with D-ranks instead of more training. I've seen your schedule. You don't want to burn yourself out, and more missions to flesh out your resume will do you good in the future. Sakura took his advice and all his lessons to heart. She wasn't fond of him the same way she was of Gunma-sensei, because he was as sober and professional as some of the guest lecturers at the academy, more interested in imparting his knowledge than building any sort of connection. Somehow, that made her even more aware that she was taking up his time, and she worked hard to not disappoint him. He made her work hard for it. He'd said his specialization was Kenjutsu, which was true, but he hadn't clarified that he was best known as an assassin. There was little of what she thought of as sword fighting in his style, which was bare of all flash and spare to the point of frankness. She spent most of their practices being killed in a single blow, Rado sensei methodically exploiting every weakness in her defenses, and then just as patiently breaking down what she'd done wrong and what she'd need to do instead. It was almost like being at the academy again, except with the personalized attention that a natural teacher's pet like Sakura had always craved and competed for. It almost made being a shinobi fun again, helped her paranoia to ease, though every night reminded her exactly why she trained so hard each day. The newest nightmares did not get better precisely, but just as she'd found with Wave, she grew better at managing them. Trying not to sleep just made them creep into her waking hours and made her sloppy besides, so she learned all sorts of tricks to fall asleep, to stay asleep, and to fall back asleep when the second didn't work out. She was careful not to work herself to exhaustion just before bed, which made the dreams more vivid, and she sometimes regarded those moments of panicked waking with a dark sort of humor. She'd never had more practice controlling her breathing and easing her heart rate. She didn't hear anything from Kakashi-sensei or her teammates during the month, and she didn't have enough spare time to spend stoking her grudge. It dissipated, the heat of her former anger cooled, though her feelings never quite returned to their original state. Naruto was just irritating, he was dangerous, and while Sasuke was beautiful, she couldn't help but wonder about that flash of cruelty. How much of it was Orochimaru and how much was Sasuke? Sakura did meet others. Ino, sporting ugly, slow healing bruises that testified that Saka hadn't spared her face, hadn't come to brag about her victory. She'd come instead to tentatively broach the idea of rekindling their friendship. I looked at you down there in the arena and I saw the same stranger I met before, when I first saw that scar, you know, and I felt like, like I was losing to you, somehow. I didn't like that, she admitted frankly, which was so Eno that Sakura was back on the academy's lawn during their lunch break. So I couldn't lose my match, no matter what that freak did. I have you to thank for that, Sakura. Eno didn't ask her about how she'd gotten the scar and Sakura didn't volunteer. Too much of their closeness had been lost and Sakura was too aware that Eno hadn't had a wave yet, hadn't had a mission take her to the edge and bring her back a different person than when she'd arrived. One day, maybe, they'd be best friends again. Until then, she was content to let Eno fashion pick at her outfit and her shema. It was the first time in a long time that she'd had a conversation that was only peripherally related to her ability to kill someone. Her other visitor was more alarming and less vocal. Gara, Tamari's teammate. Not a single word had been exchanged between them, but she'd been left with the impression it might have been a whole conversation to Gara. She had no idea what he'd taken from it. His lack of eyebrows made him even more inscrutable than those eyes alone managed. And then her month was at an end and it was time to be a part of Team 7 once again.